Well, the greatest gift a story has to give is a lesson from a life you don't have to live. So hmm. why in the world should I make the same mistakes you made? If I could just learn from your mistakes, learn from your accomplishments, it'd be, so, it'd be, it'd be silly for me not to learn from those people's stories. So I'm drawn to people's stories and then um, and I, you know, I love a good story, but if I can tell a story to, um, to help other people, it's even better. You know, I think people can, people not necessarily can relate to your success, but they can definitely relate to your failure. And I am the president and CEO of the Screw Up Club. So I've done a lot of screwed up things, but uh, again, I, I think we learn better from story. All right, what's up everybody? Welcome back to Nick Carrier's Best You Podcast. I am super excited to have the one and only Thomas Dismukes with me today. Uh, Thomas, just wanna start off by saying thanks so much for spending the time with me. Absolutely. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate you for the opportunity. Yeah, of course. So Thomas is in prior to quarantine and uh, coronavirus days as a motivational storyteller, a humorist and an adventurer and a best-selling author. But through uh, coronavirus, he's made some pivots. He's been selling some chickens and uh, just got a pet goose, as he told me right before we started recording. So uh, that's hysterical and that's awesome. And I'm really excited because I know this is going to be a unique interview and there's going to be some great storytelling um, because of so many of the crazy, weird, different things that you've done, like slept in dumpsters in England, walked through the Alps barefoot, uh, skinned a skunk in a spacesuit. And I, I watched, uh, or I think I read all of that story, which is just crazy. And then you have a world record balancing 95 glasses on your chin. So some awesome stuff that we're going to get into today, but I want to kind of start off and backtracking, and it's actually perfect with with your uh, Clemson wall or your friend's Clemson wall back there behind you. You went to Clemson, and after you got your master's degree, you basically started uh, stories that tell and started kind of this career pretty quickly right off the bat. What kind of gave you the courage and the feeling that you could jump right into this and do it successfully? Oh gosh, I, I, Nick, it's a bit of a longer story, kind of leading up to it. that. Was I was almost not at a climax of my, of my life, but it was just the perfect, um, everything had kind of become that to that, to that point, work that point. Um, I was the fourth child of six children. And I can vividly remember when I was 14 years old that uh, I looked at my life and thought, my life is almost over with. I mean, I've done nothing. What have I done? I'm 14 years old and I've done nothing in my life. And, uh, <laughs> and I remember praying. I was like, God, give me some stories, please. Just, I mean, give me some stories for my children and my great, I have nothing to tell my kids. So um, at least in my mind, a 14 year old. And um, and man, I used to pray, I'll get on a plane and I would pray that the plane would crash just so I could have, I mean, not everyone else be safe, but just well, let I me have, right, live, right. live on an island. Give me something to tell. And so um, whatever. So, I mean, and after that, I was really blessed. Like you said, those, those crazy stories. And I, I ended up going, I was a foreign exchange student in Sweden and uh, ended up discovering a lost tomb in Scotland when I was just 15, 16 years old. And that was kind of a fork in my life. And, and that was, I, that changed me. So that kind of helped me to, because before I stuttered really bad. I stuttered, I stammered, I slurred my words. I was the last person in the world to ever speak. And um, but at that point, it was kind of a fork that I realized, okay, I can do something. You know, I am worth something in this life. Somewhere along the line, that seed had been planted in my head that I couldn't do things. That I, no, it wasn't that I was worthless, but you know, I couldn't do it. And so, uh, but after that event, uh, I really kind of was on the course of, okay, Thomas, for Pete's sake, let's just try this thing. Why not live, you know, live, live our life. And, um, and so, uh, well, I mean, after the tomb story and then, then I end up going to, uh, I end up cheating on the SAT, which is another story. I didn't really cheat. I looked back at the previous section, I was kicked out. And so that's a totally horrible, funny story, but it's whatever. But, uh, so after going to Clemson, um, well, before I went to Clemson, I ended up working at Walt Disney World and doing some activities there. And so uh, it makes a long, makes a long story short, I kind of had a split life where I went to Clemson. I was working with some tissue culture, hydroponics, and bioengineering. And I was also working with some children, with abused children. And um, I kind of had a, a fork in my life again where one of my kids had a real bad seizure and I, I missed a big meeting. And so it was one of those like, okay, what are you going to do, Thomas? Either work with plants or work with kids. And so... Um, so I chose to kind of work with children, abused children. So I started telling these stories with that. And so I, I had a lot of experience just telling, just interacting with them. And I, I'd already started a speaking career in some ways early on. Um, and then we ended up moving to Tennessee and I did a lot of writing there and that kind of jazz. So, I mean, it was just an easy transition of, of um, you know, of speaking. It, it just worked out well. I'd already done a lot of writing. I'd already done a lot of speaking, doing a lot of leadership conferences and camps, but never really full time. 
And it was one of those transitions in my, in my life. I thought, you know what? Why not? Let's just give this thing a whirl. And, uh, and it just kind of exploded. I'm very blessed. I've traveled all over the world, 20 some odd countries, thousands of groups and millions of people. But I mean, I'm very blessed to have done what I love to do. And uh, I hate this coronavirus has done something to it. But you know what? It's just another, another chapter in life. So it's okay. Yeah. It's all working yep. out. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I'm, I'm fascinated that at such a young age, you were like, oh, I don't have any stories to tell. I mean, I feel like I've had probably that same sort of feeling like, oh, I want to be able to tell so many different stories and so many different cool experiences. But is there, I know it was kind of a while ago, but is there any reason why you feel like you were so drawn to wanting to tell stories? I, I don't, well, I think my family, my grandfather's a big storyteller, uh, not, you know, not professional by any means, but he, I was just, gosh, I love just, to, I love hearing your stories. I love hearing anyone's stories for that matter. I used to love going to nursing homes and just hearing those people's stories. And I'm drawn to the fact that, I mean, I don't even know my great grandfather. I don't know if you know your great, great grandfather. I mean, I, you know, they they have a whole life and a whole story. They'll never be heard. And uh, so I'm drawn to the fact that, uh, and again, it's not about me, but I, I just, I loved, um, well, the greatest gift a story has to give is a lesson from a life you don't have to live. So mm -hmm. why in the world should I make the same mistakes you made? If I could just learn from your mistakes, learn from your accomplishments, it'd be, so, it'd be, it'd be silly for me not to learn from those people's stories. So I'm drawn to people's stories. And then um, and I, you know, I love a good story. But if I can tell a story to, um, to help other people, it's even better. You know, I think people can... People not necessarily can relate to your success, but they can definitely relate to your failure. And I am the president and CEO of the Screw Up Club. So I've done a lot of screwed up things. But uh, again, I, I think we learn better from stories. And, and I've, um, you know, if you, you go to conferences and they have a lot of data and information stuff, and you kind of zone out. But the moment people tell a story, it automatically pulls you back in. And so uh, I'm drawn to the power of a story just because people can relate to them. But um, yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a, that's a great point. It's funny that we're having this conversation now because like I said yesterday, I had another podcast interview with somebody and he had just written a book. And I was like, what was your kind of biggest takeaway when you had to go back and forth between editing it and your copywriter was giving you some tips and stuff? And she was like, he, he said that my copywriter was like, you got to put more stories in there. You got to put more stories in there because a lot of times it's easy to just say, here's the advice, here's the advice, here's the information but people just are not going to connect with that. So he had to really work on creating different stories in there. And I was like, yeah, I definitely feel like anytime I read a book or watch a YouTube video, I always connect with the lesson a whole lot better if I hear a story come along with it. Absolutely. I, I said the greatest gift the story has to give is a lesson from a life you don't have to live or a lesson in business or lesson in life, lesson in something. And so uh, absolutely, I think stories are just, that's how our brain actually connects is through stories, not necessarily through data points, but um, yeah, there, there's little synapses and whatever, yeah. that, whatever all the neuro stuff is. We, we connect better through stories. Absolutely. Yeah. Can, can you, can you say that line? You said it a couple of times now, the lesson to give is a life you don't have to live or something like that. What was it? Greatest gift a story has to give is a lesson from a life you don't have to live. Mm, that's I, awesome. I, I, me, that, that's one of those. It's a huge, it, it's a very simple story. It's a very simple phrase, but I think it's absolutely true. If people will just tell their stories more. I'm drawn to people who, I mean, I don't, I don't want to keep on harping on failure, but I mean, I have failed. I failed 90% of my life. I feel like I failed. Not to say I've succeeded a great deal. I'm very, I am crazy blessed. I'm content. I'm happy with what I have, but I have failed a lot. And, um, and I think as part of success, I think we have created this culture of I've got to succeed. And, and uh, there's a quote, oh, uh, if you don't first succeed, no, no, uh, Oh, I'll think of it. Oh, uh, oh my grace. It's some of the fact that uh, uh, we're so, we had to succeed first. We have, we have to be right, the, the right every single time. If you don't, I'll think of it in a minute. I'll come to you in a minute. Yeah. Basically, we've created this culture of it has to be perfect the first time. It's right. okay to fail. And uh, and it, I encourage people. I, I mean, I, I've set my kids up not to fail, but I've, I set them up to, I want them to fall down. I want them to mess up. And that's just how we grow. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, well, I, I think that's how we do it. I'm, I'm going to stick with this right now because actually it's it's so funny. The guy who's I interviewed yesterday, I have his book sitting here right beside me, and it's called A Failure's Guide to Business Success. So it talks about failure and and brings in different stories and stuff. And I've the more more and more I have conversations with young people my age and like the beginning of their jobs. It's exactly what you just said. So many people are 
scared to screw up or scared to show that they don't have all the answers or scared to show that they're actually not an expert because they feel like they should. Like, what's the message to that person that's like, look, you are 23, you're 26, you're 27, you're 28. You don't have to be an expert. Nobody really expects you to be an expert. Yeah. What's yeah, kind I, of the I, message I, to them? I totally agree with that. That's, that's what I'm saying. It's, and I just wanted to goodness, there's a quote in my head. I can't think of <laughs> Hey, you'll, you'll get it like right when we stop oh, no, recording. No, I'm, ah, there it is. I, I'm going to interrupt myself in a minute. But uh Oh, it's an old quote. It's one of those like, you know, adults would automatically say it, but it's, it's wrong. It's basically we've, we've, we've created, again, we've created this society that ha- we think, well, it's, if it's not right when I, oh my, okay, perfect example. Uh, a friend of mine, he's a big computer guy and he, he's created this amazing program and he wants it to be perfect. Well, I don't want to fail. I don't want to mess up. It's okay. Just get it out there. Sometimes if you get 80% right, you're doing pretty good. And then, you know, it, it, but we have, we've created this mindset of, I got to get the trophy or whatever. Uh, it is okay to fail. And I, I encourage you to fail. Uh, if you're not, uh, I will get it. minute. If you don't do it right the first time, something, I can't remember. I was dropping nuts. It's a, great <laughs> quote. It's a great quote, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I no, I think I, you're I, right. And, and one of the things that I, the, one of the things that I've really realized and what's made me so much more comfortable with screwing up or failing is realizing that, so many times I have to do the wrong thing to actually know what the right thing is and go the wrong direction so I actually know the right direction because a lot of times you don't know you like you, you don't know what you don't know. So you in order to find out, you have to screw up or you have to make the wrong decision. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. So so let's get let's get into a, one of your stories then. What I know you like you said you failed ninety percent of your life and you've had a lot of failures, but what's maybe one of the the biggest failures that you feel like had one of the biggest impacts on you and allowed you to learn one of the biggest lessons that you use moving forward. Well, I, okay, I, I, I kind of mentioned this earlier when I, when I was in high school, and I won't tell the whole story. It's kind of a it's kind of a silly, wouldn't it? But um, but when I cheated on SAT, it's a, I, all my life for twelve years of my life. I had a good friend named Jeff, and we were uh, we're going to be landscape architects, go to Clemson University, major in Clemson, major in landscape architecture, and be millionaires by the time we we're 30 years old. I mean, in our brain, that's the way I had it all figured out. And literally, for 12 years of our life, by the time we were seniors in high school, we had everything all planned out, where we're going to go. And so um, I have to take the SAT and, uh, you know, take my rival high school, and I'll, I'll tell you a really quick version of it. But basically, um, I don't like English very much. I like math. So uh, I, I did the math section and they called time on me and I had one little problem left and the guy kept saying, don't look back at the previous section. Uh, and so I closed up, they took a break, did the English and I had a few minutes left over and, uh, and I started thinking about that one math problem and I flipped back to the math problem and I wasn't going to cheat. I wasn't going to fill it in. I just wanted to solve it. And so, um, and, uh, you know, until so there's a lady over looking over my shoulder and watching me look back at the previous section. She simply closed up my book and walked away. And, of course, I freaked out. And so um, I uh, oh, it was horrible. And I started, I started thinking it's going to go my permanent record. And, you know, I'm going to go to jail. I'm not going to get a house. I'm not going to have a car. I'm going to have some, you know, maximum, supri- maximum prison, you know, roommate named Bubba making me scratch his back <laughs> or something at nighttime. All this crazy stuff. But so to make a long story short, I ended up um, – going home and uh oh it was, it was whatever i don't even tell you all the stuff it was horrible i ended up oh it was no I, I want to hear it i want to hear it I, okay I, i'll tell you the really really quick version of it basically like i said all my life is all planned out and so uh i um my father came out and picked me up and uh, my little sister was in the car so he couldn't really tell me i couldn't really tell him whatever everything was going on so i went back home ran upstairs to my room and my dad and i started crying i was like oh my life is over with i just want to kill myself you know all you know and at that point in my life i really i recognized i screwed up my life is over and um and so my dad followed up behind me and my older brother brian and like what's going on i was like dad i cheated on sat i look back at the previous section what a horrible day just can't get any worse than this you know and and uh, my dad never punished me for it because he knew i punished myself far more than he could ever punish me and my older brother brian with his infinite wisdom uh, here, I think we were in November. I think he said, uh, Thomas, you know, here is November, and we got some pumpkins left over from Halloween. And uh, why don't you go get my 12 gauge shotgun and we'll go outside and we'll just blow some pumpkins away. And so that, that, that'll get rid of the stress. And so here I am. I just said, I want to kill myself. My older brother Brian puts a, a gun in my hand, but um, oh, it's horrible. So I, in, my, in my house, it's a law. We never have a loaded gun in the house. And so I walked outside, I, you know, pump, pump. I'm waiting for my brother to come back out, pump, pump, click. You know, of course, something happens. You pump, pump, click. And, Pump, pump, you know, feeling pretty good, you know. And about that time, Flower, my family's cat, walks around the corner. So she walked around, you know, pump, pump, click. And 
the pump, pump, click. And so she's here and she's, I'm right here. She's right there just behind my neighbor, just behind my cat is my, my neighbor sitting on his back porch. Pump, pump, I'm kind of eyeing a uh, flower, you know, and I slow pull it. Or I, 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 pump up one more time. My neighbor just stands up, walks inside, pump up again, slow pull the trigger, kaboom. And there was a hidden bullet in the shotgun. And, uh, and I saw a flower jump out, so you know, kind of jump off the side of the wall. And I was like, oh my goodness, what a horrible day. I just cheated on SAT, I almost shot my neighbor. Kitty, 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 where are you? Kitty, 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 you know? And I looked over the wall and and uh, I couldn't find the cat, but I saw the stringy stuff all over the walls everywhere. It's getting really gross. But, uh, and I picked up the stringy stuff and it was flowers intestines and I just blew her off the wall. And so my older brother, Brian, he has a shotgun goes off. He runs out the back door. He sees me holding flowers intestines in my hands. He thinks it's my brains that are hanging out. He's like, why Thomas? Why do you want to shoot yourself in the head? Why? You know, and uh, it's a horrible day. I cheated on SAT, almost shot my neighbor, killed my cat. Horrible, horrible day. And I find no humor at the exploitation of the murder of my cat. I, you know how many times I get how many times I get reviews on that? I don't find that very funny at all. Oh, so many people have ever commented on that. It's a horrible story. However, Nick, to answer your question, a simple flip of a sheet of paper. I mean, I freaking flipped a sheet of paper over and it changed my life. The most, I mean, that story, the power of our choices. It is amazing. The power of our choices. You live and die by the choices you make. I tell my children every day, every day, every day, our life is made of choices and our choices make our life. And you're asking, you know, what follow through? Well, how do we follow through? Every single day of our life, we make choices and we have no idea the consequences of those choices. I mean, it's the butterfly effect or whatever. I mean, every choice you make has a direct effect on other people and the power that we do. I mean, the power of choices. And so at that point on, I kind of realized the power of our choice. Don't look back at the previous sections of our life. You know, we constantly flip back and say, gosh, I can't believe you did this. Or, you know, we're all cheaters because we're all constantly cheating ourselves to look back. Oh, I wish I'd done this, or I wish I had done that. Or, oh, if, I'd never, if that had to happen to me, you know, make all those excuses. And, um, but the lesson of that is the point in my life when I realized, when you look in the mirror and you say, I am where I am today because of the choices that I have made, that's when you start to grow. That's when you start to mature. I can't blame my problems on my family. I, obviously, I can't choose my family, but, uh, you know, we, how you can react to them. But you can't, you know, you can't blame problems on politics or whatever else. You are where you are today because of the choices that you've made. And I think, I think you become mature as an adult, as a human being, and, and uh, helping accomplish your goals when you can realize that, the power of your choices. And so, I mean, it all rolls down to that. It, it starts off with your head, and then it, your actions follow after yeah. it. But it's a horrible story, but it's a great lesson for me. I don't even tell it anymore because it's such a terrible story. But the power of our choices, is, is, it's big. It's huge. I get. I mean, it's a it's a terrible story that your cat died. And if any of you guys are cat lovers out there, I'm sorry, but I had to do everything in my power to hold back from just absolutely dying laughing on <laughs> during that. That was absolutely hysterical. But to go to the actual lesson that your choices matter, I think that you know it's really easy for somebody to hear that and think like, oh yeah, I know my choices matter. But it's like no, like they actually matter, and that's one of the biggest things where. I try to stress the importance of why it's so important to get closer to the best version of yourself because if the be if you are acting as closer to the best version of yourself, your actions are going to be that much more impactful for everybody. Like if every person knows 1,000 other people, then you're one step away from affecting 1,000 people. You're a couple steps away from affecting a million people, a few steps away from affecting a billion people. And I know it kind of sounds crazy to like think that you could really impact that many, but it like... If, if any time has shown us the reality of that, it's the coronavirus. It's like the action of one person can, exactly, exactly. And so, and the best thing about it is it's not like you are where you are today because of the choice that you've made in the past. So like, shame on you. It's like, no, that's not the, the lesson. The lesson is like, no, now take ownership of the choices and the decisions that you make moving forward. Yes, yes, yes. Be a victor rather than a victim. I mean, and I've got oh, my heart breaks to those people that have created this culture or has created this mindset somewhere along the line that whether it's parents or family or what a victim mentality. Oh, my gracious. And well, whatever. I'm, I'm, about, I'm touching on stuff now, but it's, yeah, I, I, I agree. It, it's one of those things to move forward, to grow, to progress, to grow. I think we're, con we are made to move. We're made to explore. What is a great quote? Uh, the ship 
sh sh uh, ships are safe in the harbor, but that's not what they're made for. We are, we are made to go, to sail, to, to explore, to move. And the, the coronavirus puts it in a perfect. I mean, people are shut in and they're, people are depressed. People are committing suicide, horrible things because they're, they're not allowed to go, to grow. And, um, oh gosh, Nick, I mean, I, I've had the joy to go to the Soviet Union and, and a com other communist nations and stuff or whatever, but it, uh, you can feel it. I mean, you can feel the oppression of people that do not have the freedom to choose. Do you know what I'm saying? I and mean, you can feel it and uh, that they, they want to grow, they, they want to go. And I think we've already, you're already starting to feel that already. Uh, maybe myself. I mean, I, I think there was a bit of a, maybe a week or so of where you kind of mourn the loss of what used to be. But, uh, but no, you, you get, we get complacent with sitting on our, on our rear end and, and being quarantined and, and not, not going. So it's going to take a little people like yourself. I mean, people like yourself to get up and, and go to encourage people to, to do it. But yeah, uh, but, well, I, but I also think it's our responsibility of encouraging each other too. the power of our words, power of words, that's a huge thing too. So Yeah, no doubt. So obviously one of the things that you're kind of an expert in is storytelling and you just told an awesome story and I was super engaged and I know everybody else had to have been super engaged, but we've all probably also had the experience of when somebody's telling a story and we're like, oh my gosh, where the hell is this thing going to end? Because it's, <laughs> it's so bad. And so I do think that some people are probably better natural storytellers than others, but it's also definitely a craft and a skill I feel like that you can work on and, and you can develop, which you've probably done a lot over the last few years. So what are some of like maybe two or three keys that you have really worked on when storytelling and when kind of crafting up some of your stories, if you will. Well, well again, I, I don't craft any of my stories. You don't have to create stupidity. I mean, it just kind of comes naturally. But um, but I mean, I think what everyone always asks themselves is what's in it for me? I mean, any audience member, what's in it for me? You know, okay, great story, but what? how is it going to relate to my own life? So any kind of story that I do tell, you know, I got to think, you know, what, how are they going to relate to it? How is it going to impact their life? Is what Are they going to learn something from it? Um, and in business, I mean, it, who cares? I, mean, who, I can get up there on the, in the audience or from the stage and tell a lot of stories that I would love to tell. But if that's not what they want to hear, then I'm kind of defeating the purpose. So it really is all about them. In any kind of presentation you give, uh, stories are important. You have to kind of create that trust and credibility. But ultimately, people ask, what's in it for me? So you're giving them something they're going to take home with. And so I, I think that's all really helpful. I mean, I mean you can, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, Nick. Um, I mean, you can use outdoor out, you know, repetition of words. And, and there's a rodeo story that I tell where I ride upside down on the horse's belly. And I'm literally riding, you know, on the chair upside down. So there's things you can do to keep people's attention. But I think ultimately, not to say it's selfish, but just people always ask. So you know, people always turn it back to themselves. How is this going to relate to my life? So as a speaker, yeah. any storyteller, you, I think you want to answer that question if you can. Yeah. Gotcha. So like, is it, do you do that by when you kind of are wrapping up the story, you try to bridge that gap by giving them kind of a lesson or like, how do you go about answering that question in their head? I, I, yeah, I think so. I, I will. There's certainly, it's funny you say that, uh, there's certain lessons that I have in my, in my, uh, my stories, but I can't tell you how many times I've heard people walk up to me afterwards and say, Thomas, thanks for telling the story. I learned da, 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 da. And I thought, like, where did you get that from? I mean, and, and they have interpreted it so totally different, which is great. I was very excited. I never even thought about that. So um, sure, I think you kind of, not, not that you want to feed it to them, but I, I do have certain principles that I would love to get across. And, um, you know, as uh, the, the meeting planner may specifically say, Thomas, we really are struggling with this. Can you focus on these things? But, uh, but no, I, I think people, you know, I, people interpret things different ways. And it's amazing how people say, thank you for saying this. And I know I never said it, but they, their mind interpreted what I said and, and they, they incorporated it their own different ways. That's what the, the beauty about stories that everyone has a story in their own past. They, you, you, you know, you relate that story differently. Um, I can yeah. tell the, you know, same story, a hundred people and get 101 different reactions. So. Yeah, no, I think, no, I think that's, I think that's so true because I feel like people, and I don't, I can't even remember exactly what I was thinking of what the lesson was going to be from the story of flipping back and, and, and cheating on the SAT. But when you said the story is the power of choice, I was like, oh, I actually didn't really see him necessarily going there. And I don't know, I can't remember what my interpretation was in my head, but 
I feel like probably listen, people listening to probably had different interpretations and different lessons they could have extracted from it. So I think that's interesting. Um, and I don't even tell, hardly tell that story much anymore. I didn't usually just mention this power of choice, but, but that's one of those stories where I enjoy telling it, but I, I know I get a bad <laughs> reaction from it because it's pretty gross. And there's a lot more in depth to it too. But there's a story of where I discovered a lost tomb, you know, in Scotland. And uh, that was a huge, I mean, that, that literally, I love that story because it changed me. I mean, it literally changed my life, but it's not funny. And so some people just depends on what people want. Some people just want to laugh and you just want to sit back and relax. And so I don't tell that story. It's more about the power of our words and the power of our thoughts and encouraging other people. You know, the, you know we live and die by the choices we make. And but also, I mean, um, just the power of our thoughts, Every, everything starts in our brain and the power of our words, there's life and death in our words. And so I'm sorry, there's, there's different stories that I, that I want to tell, but it really ultimately, what does your audience want? What does your customer want? So it doesn't matter if you're speaking or selling gizmos, who cares what you want? What does your yeah. customer want? So, yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to transition a little bit to how you have that world record of balancing 95 glasses on your chin. And I've seen you balance ladders on your chin and know you do a ton of different things of balancing on your chin. So just to start off, like with not the, the lesson of balance, but how the hell did you get into start balancing stuff on your oh, chin? Oh gosh, I tell you, I, I've been balancing things on my chin probably since I was eight eight years old. Easy. I mean, I've been. Just, I mean, I'm just goofy. Well, why not? It's one of those. You know, I balance little, you know, uh, brooms on my fingers, and I thought, well, if I can do it on my finger, then maybe I could do it on my chin. And so, you know, I just started balancing stuff on my chin. So it, I've been doing that all my life. And to me, that's what's so. And I find that fascinating. To me, it's nothing. I mean, it's like anybody can do this. I promise you, Nick, I can teach you how to do that within 10 minutes. You can do it. It's really nothing, but it's just a matter of going out there and goofing off with it. But, um, but it, it also goes to show you that everyone has unique talents and random. My, my grandfather told us all the time that, you know, we're all here for a reason. We all have unique talents. And I thought, what's so unique about balancing things in your chin? So, uh, but I find that fascinating that everyone, everyone has talents. Problem is, if you had that talent, you think everyone else has that same talent too. But you don't realize, no, that is a unique, weird, cool talent. Well, yeah, whether it's my, in my case, it's balancing th- something on my chin, but you know, other people, it's different talents. But um, but no, I've been balancing things on my chin all my life, and that actually, in the end, saved my life. Actually, but uh, but yeah, I've yeah. Probably- what I, what what you said right there, I think, is so key because that's a very specific example of something that I've heard before is so many times we are so close to our own uniqueness Mm -hmm. that we aren't able to actually see it. And I think that's so many people of, you know, a a frequent question that I get asked or that other people get asked is how do you discover what your passion is? How do you know exactly what you want to do? And I think a lot of times it takes somebody else kind of revealing to you what's special about you or what's unique about you for you to be like, Oh, I didn't realize that that was only me or that that was kind of special to me. And I think that was really, really key to what you just talked about. That's exactly, I see it all the time. It's like, well, everybody can do this. No, not everybody can do this. Do you have any idea how unique that is? That's cool stuff. It didn't have to be all that earth shattering either. I mean, I know when I was doing a master's degree, I thought I had to cure cancer, but you know, because it had to be so big, but I learned, no, all you, you're just a little tiny piece in this huge, big puzzle, this huge, big, wonderful puzzle of life. And, uh, you know, it, it, you don't have to try to conquer the world or cure the or cure cancer. It's just you're just doing your little tiny little part. And um, in some ways, it's kind of, you know, depressing. <laughs> but, but in some ways, you know what? It's OK. You just do what you can do while you've got it and use your unique talents. And uh, well, oh, but I, there's I, here it is. Yes. Sorry, go ahead. Please. No, go ahead. You got what? it. Anything worth doing is worth doing. Everyone always says worth doing right. I think anything worth doing is worth doing wrong, at least the first couple of times but uh we've got in our head anything worth doing is worth doing right no it's okay to screw up it's okay to mess up which leads into your balancing question also is that when i broke that world record i actually practiced with 60 glasses in my house before the record and i didn't do it. i couldn't even do 60 i, I mean I, so it was really odd to say this but um i was actually going there knowing that i was going to fail and i'd never failed like that before i wanted to see what does it feel like to be a complete, utter failure in front of hundreds of people. I mean, we had a Guinness World Record people there and had all kinds of people to, witnessing it and all the paperwork. And I was going there knowing I was going to fail. And uh, and I wanted to know what it felt like. I was going to feel, I mean, what's so wrong with failing? And, uh, and so I was anticipating failure or doing that. But uh, but apparently my adrenaline kicked in and I ended up doing 95. But uh, I tried 60 and I couldn't do it at home. But I did 95 at the ball field. But, um, but so it was, but that's kind of funny. It's, we, I, 
um, I set myself up knowing that I was not going to succeed and I, cause I wanted to see what it felt like. So wow. I mean, I failed, but, but I've, I've never done it that big. I mean, I wasn't, right. why not? It's okay. So. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, so a couple of things I want to go back to is I, I love, love the quote that you brought back up. And I think I've, I think I've heard like Zig Ziglar say it like that, but say it in the way you said it, that anything worth doing is worth doing wrong a million times before you actually get it right or something like that. But then the other thing I wanted to go back to was how you said, you know, we're this small part of this huge world. But, you know, we talked about earlier how you can impact so many people. So there's definitely this balance of like realizing that like, look, the world doesn't revolve around you. Like you're not that big of a deal. Don't think everybody's always thinking about you. But at the same time, you have the ability to make an impact on so many people. So there's this kind of balance and different applications to both those ideas. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good point. Yeah, I, it's very humbling. I totally agree with you. Think, what is the quote that you want to make yourself humble? Stick your fist in a bucket of water and pull it out. And as fast as that water will replace that hole, that's how fast you'll be replaced. And mm. that's the truth. You will be replaced. And that's what breaks my heart about, you know, I don't even know my great, great grandfather. I remember, I know my, my grandfather, but my, not his father. I barely even know his name. And, um, you know, the stories and lessons that he's learned. And, uh, you know, so I, I'm, I'm kind of a people watcher. I love to kind of figure out what's going on in your life. But, uh, but that's what's drawn to me. Like, what is your story? What is your life? What can, what little golden nugget that I can, I uh, get, and there's no doubt in my mind, give me 10 minutes with anyone. And there's something in your life that I can pull from your success or your failures that I can then take it and plant it in my heart, you know, as a little golden nugget of wisdom. And, um, and that, I mean, I've really, that's been the biggest blessing for me as a speaker. I mean, I've met so many wonderful people, very famous people, but also just regular old common people. And every single one of them have given me some kind of little golden nugget that I've actually used in presentations and it's different things, but oh my goodness, just, it, it, but people are afraid to share. People should not be afraid to share that. And I think people are afraid to share those failures or successes, but we have golden nuggets in us, man, that people oh, crave to crave to have that wisdom and uh, yeah. holding it back. So I, I think we got to absolutely all share it. So no. yes, you are very valuable, but you are replaceable too. So don't get all right. cocky. That's exactly right. 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 And, uh, and I think what you said is really important how no matter who you talk to, you can learn something from because I know that one of my biggest learning tools in terms of like my fitness goal setting stuff is the clients that I teach. And when they were like, I'm having this problem, I'm not able to do this. Um, or now I tried doing this and I actually did follow through. I'm like, Oh, that was a good, that's a good idea. Like that's, that's definitely worth me sharing with other people. And so a lot of people don't think that their experiences are worth sharing or that they're going to help people out that much when they really could. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, again, I, I feel like we're beating the dead horse at this point, but it's, yeah, that, that people have so much stories to tell if they would just, it's okay to give it. And, um, but I'll, uh, and that's the fine line of giving it. People may not want to hear it, but uh, like you said, some stories are like where are you going with this, but uh, and that, that's just a, that's a, I think it's a sign of maturity of knowing when to win, you know, when to shut up, and you know, and if people are asking you for it, then give it to them. But uh, but I, I don't think we should be afraid and um, to tell our story, or we should all be confident to know that you are unique. You do have talents. You do have a story to tell, whether how crazy it may be or, or simple, or what, common it may be. It doesn't matter. I'm, I feel like I've lived a very common life. To me, this is normal, but we have, you know, an obligation. It's our responsibility to tell their story, to tell your story. And uh, that's kind of my underlying kind of a theme or passion. I always love to do in my presentations, just kind of, even though it's not what they requested, I always try to slide that under the radar that, it is your obligation. It's your responsibility to detail your story, and um, mm -hmm. that, that's you know that's kind of what you're what's what you're here for. We're here for a man. My grandfather, you know, he used to always light a match and you know a little wooden stove, and he'd say, "Kid, this is our life. This is our life." And you know, and every single day we have the power to choose: wake up in the morning and live our life to the fullest, or you know, or, or do nothing. We want to build people up or break people down. And every day we in our life until you know we have a choice until what our little light runs out. And he lived almost 90 years old. And, uh, but I mean, the grand scheme of things, our life is so short. And I mean, it is so precious. And mm -hmm. uh, you got to take advantage of it, man. I mean, this is it. I mean, it's so quick and so precious. Yeah. Well, to, to kind of get back on the word of balance a little bit, I know you like to talk about the importance of like living a life of balance and stuff like that. So I think there are definitely different interpretations of what balanced life means. So for you, what do you, what do you kind of mean by living a balanced life? 
Well, uh, you mentioned this a couple of years ago, I ended up writing a book called a leader's focus and it kind of talks about, you know, and I, I'll balance something on my chin to even just to, to um, display this in presentations and stuff to kind of have that leader's focus and a balance in life. But, and I, and I go through F O C U S and F stands for first things first. And then O stands for others and going all the way down. But uh, that's big to have a good balance. I think, and I think everybody really relating this even more so with COVID is that, if your career is gone, then what else do you have? We kind of narrow it down to what are our what our priorities in life. I'm a Christian, so first things first in my life is my relationship with Christ. Then it's my, my relationship with my wife. Then it's my relationship with my children. Then it's my relationship with my close circle of family and friends. And then it's my career. And obviously, you know, I feel like I'm serving my faith through my career or making take care of my family. So it, it is kind of all one thing. But you have to have those priorities, Nick. I mean, my goodness, we and I feel like now more than ever we have kind of we have definitely consolidated what is important to us in our life. And so I think, unfortunately, oh gosh, I can't tell you, Nick. I, I mean, I, I've, I've met millionaires. I met, I guess I've met two billionaires in my life, but millionaires that had everything, very successful in this world, very successful. But, uh, but and they've told me multiple times, and I've heard this over and over again, that they would sell their entire fortune if they could just have a better relationship with their wife, if their children even knew who they were. Uh, they would give it all away. Very successful in life, but a failure in relationship to their relationships. And they would, you know, and they didn't mean anything to them. Uh, the the businesses, uh, if they could, if it didn't have their family. So, and I was in Switzerland one time speaking to a bunch of very fluent children, uh, teenagers. I mean, these people are ambassadors, presidents, you know, all CEOs of children. And every one of those kids said, you know, knowing that they were all billionaires, materially, they had everything. You know, what do you want most in your life? And nine out of 10 said, I just want to spend more time with my mom and dad. So, I, I, what is a good balance in life? Where are your priorities? Ultimately, it's mm -hmm. where getting your priorities straight. Once you get your priorities straight, then everything else falls in line. You know, get your priorities straight. And then just like the book talks about that. I mean, I wrote that book, not for people. I really wrote it for my, for my children. And uh, cause that is my life. That is, that is how I live my life every day. Get your priorities straight. O stands for serving others. Uh, you know, if you want to get out, if you want to be, get out of depression, then stop thinking about yourself and start focusing on other people, help other people, encourage other people, find out, you know, serve other people, lead by example. Uh, C stands for character, living your life of character, communication. C also stands for consumption, living under your means. Oh, gracious, how much of our choices have we made because out of impulse, I got to have money or, you know, we have careers that we hate. 70% of people who have careers hate their job. I cannot imagine that, but because they, they, they lived over, over their means and, you know, they have to have that career. And so, uh, you know, and you is always seeking understanding, never too old to learn something new, or in my case, do something stupid. And so always learning. And S stands for, you know, smiling, the power of our smile, taking care of yourself, you know, always going to the source of your problems, nipping it in the bud. And uh, sorry about that. Um, but uh, but uh, so it's, you know, that, that's kind of, that book is really my balance in life. That is literally the way I see things in life. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Definitely important to align your priorities every single day and make sure that you kind of fill fill those different buckets that you talked about because one of the biggest pieces of pieces of advice that I got is you know if you split your life in to those different areas with as like family, career, personal, professional, spiritual, all these kind of different things like it's okay for one to be spiking at a, at a particular time but that doesn't mean you can leave all the others behind. You have to be it like a wheel. That's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, if you think each one is like a little spoke and a wheel, mm. some spokes can be higher than the other. But yeah, ideally, you, know, you want your wheel to nice and roll, you know, or if it's laid out flat like a chart, you know, would you want to lay down on your bed? You know, if it's all spiky, you want it nice and level. So, and, and it's, it's some work in progress to say you've got it all figured out is you're being foolish. But um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. But yeah, I no, no, that was perfect. It's wheel. That's all it is. Just a big wheel. Yeah. Perfect. Different analogy. You, if, if, if one uh, spoke of the wheel completely is deteriorated, then it's not going to turn. So you need to have all of them. That's right. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, down to uh, the last couple of questions here, Thomas. So I think that in order to get closer to the best version of yourself, it's really important to visualize kind of what you think the best version of yourself looks like, what the best version of yourself is capable of. And then my goal every single day is to try to reverse engineer that person into reality. And so a question that I found that's really important for myself is what I'm getting ready to ask you is, is there a particular skill, a piece of knowledge or an experience that the best version of yourself has that you don't currently have? Wow. That's good stuff that I don't currently have. I, I, wow. Nick, I, I, I don't know. I like, so I think I've, uh, I'm not saying I've, I have. Or, or maybe, maybe it's a skill 
kind of piece of knowledge or something that you have, but you would like to improve on? Improve on, sure, sure. I, I, like I said, I've, I've kind of got to the point, I've gotten where I'm really not complacent, but I'm very content in my life. And I think that's kind of, that's a balance that I've always tried to find, uh, you know, because I think once we, I have, I'm getting that way now. I, I guess I am saying I'm to the place now where I've always, because I knew that was, it was a problem for me. So I guess I'll say this this way. It was a, you know, compare always leads to despair. And so most of my life, I was always uh, like, you know, I, I, um, I would have something and I would be so happy with it. Oh, look how great it is. And then I would look over and like, crap, this is a piece of crap. Look what they have. And they have so much better. And then I would finally get what they have. And I was like, man, yes, this is nice. And I would look over what they have and like, crap. What I, and so I was constantly comparing things, my life with other people. And so um, I'm getting now to the place where I'm, I'm it, it, to say I'm content seems pretty shallow, but I, I finally am content. You know what I'm saying? It's a big deal. I'm 40 something years old. And now I can finally say, okay, I don't have to compare my life with other people, you know, compare leads to despair because if I have a lot of good stuff and, you know, I, it's, it, I'm either very prideful because I say, look what I have and, or look at, you know, now you don't have somebody very prideful or I'll feel depressed because you know, if I'm comparing my life with other people and they have so much stuff and I don't. So either way it's, it's wrong to do. So it, that's a skill and a, 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 a something that I've had to work on all my life. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, yeah. You know, a struggle of what should I be doing to make, to be better, to be better than everyone else? No. How about just be better than me? I mean, or let me just focus on what I can do, Thomas Dismukes, and be, let me be the best me, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. I'm not there yet, but that's something I have always struggled with. And I feel like I'm getting there finally. And maybe you don't have to deal with that. But in my mind, that was something I'd always struggle with, to just compare my life with other people. Yeah, well, actually, I want to ask a question on that, too, because I think I think everybody has that. And with, nowadays, with everything so open with social media and internet and everything like that, it's, it's just magnified. Everybody never has enough. So what's, what, do you, what do you think has helped you with that, to not, to not let comparison lead to despair? Well, I think first off, I don't, I'm not on social media. <laughs> I don't even do that stuff anymore. Uh, my wife has taken over my Facebook page. So if, if you ever Facebook me, it's, it's my wife, not me. But it's, uh, I mean, well, you know, what's interesting is that I was speaking to a leadership conference to these teenagers and I asked them, there was a, these are really smart kids too. And I said, what is the greatest problem in America? And overwhelmingly, do you know what they said, what the greatest problem in America was? To them, they said the greatest problem in America was technology. I say technology, technology. That's your baby. Are you kidding me? You're, you know, y'all are the technological age. And but they said no because they know that Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that kind of stuff. They said they knew it's just a facade. It's not real. And uh, it, it it bothered that all that they craved realness. Do you know? And so um, they realized all that you know, comparing their life and, and that what they were doing on Facebook or Twitter, it wasn't real. And they knew it wasn't real, and they were playing that same game. So. I, I stopped doing that. You know, there is some value to fake it till you make it, uh, you know, in some things, but, but, uh, but I, I don't, I, I try not to look at other speakers. You know, I learn from, I read, I, you know, I'm always studying, but I try not to look at my life at other people. I, you know what, what else helps me is by being happy for other people's success. Um, a good definition of a great friend is someone who is genuinely happy for your success. And so you will stop comparing other people's life, what you don't have, if you're happy for their success. And so be happy mm. for them. And that has helped me to not compare, you know, and otherwise I'm like, Oh, I don't have it. Man, be happy for them. Be, be excited for their success. And I think that'll help you not compare to as well. So. Yeah. I think, I think that, I think two things there that I really, that I thought were awesome was, was one, like, be a friend of that person, be happy for their success, like you just said. But then the other thing that you kind of threw in there was um, you don't list, you don't watch other speakers all that much, but you still like learn from them. You read and, and do these different things. So my point there is when you're looking at someone who you might traditionally compare yourself to and be like, I don't have as much as them, don't look at it in that light. Look at it in a light. It's like, what can I learn from them? So instead of like having, in, instead of placing this gap between you and them and what they have and you don't, just like place the gap in like curiosity. It's like what skills or knowledge that they have that I could potentially have, maybe. Absolutely, kind of pull from their knowledge. Yeah, I think the key of it is to be real. Continue to be real. I mean, I'll, uh, I mentioned this in the book, whatever. All my life, I always wanted a Rolex watch, and uh, I'll make this story real quick. I know we got to go, but the. Uh, 
uh, I end up saving my money. I cut grass. I chopped wood to clean out gutters. I thought one day I'm going to ride by myself. I'll roll XY. And so I ended up going to New York City. True story. New York, downtown New York City, Manhattan, sitting on the sidewalk. Some guy walks up to me in a big old long jacket. You know, gets a jacket, opens it wide up. You know, of course, there's stringy, you know, there's jewelry and watches hanging all everywhere. And he sees me looking at the silver Rolex watch, which is what, what I always wanted all my life. So he pulls it out and I, and I almost lost it. I was like, that is exactly what I've always wanted. And he's like, man, it's a for real Rolex watch. I was like, man, I, I'm, I love that. What, 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 how, how much is it? I said, man, this is a for real. This is for real. It's about $15,000. I said, $15,000? Are you kidding me? You know, can you, can you give me a better deal than this? So he started, you know, kind of looking around and he's like, man, I, I mean, because you look like a good guy. I'm going to say this for real watch, for real Rolex watch or for 20 bucks, $20, you know. And so as a make long story short, I ended up bargaining the guy down for $15, you know, and, and I, and I, I, man, I, that was, uh, I wore that Rolex for years, but, uh, but on the outside, it looked real, you know, uh, it even said it was a Rolex, you know, but, uh, but it, it wasn't, it, it was a Folex, you know, I, I didn't even take it off when I walked through the metal detector, it was all plastic, but I wore it around for years, I mean, years, probably 10 years, um, to remind me, you know, on the outside, boy, it looked all shiny, he looked all pretty, you know, but on the inside, I was all junk, and so it was, it was a constant reminder to me, Thomas, are you the real deal? Are you being genuine? Are you being the real deal? Are, are you just going to be all nice, little facade, look good? But on, are you just junk? It's so sad that people live their entire life trying to prove with people who they are, and they don't even know themselves. And so mm. I take, I mean, it's something that, that I, I, I not I struggle with, but it's something I'm constantly asking myself. Yeah, learn from other people. Take take little nuggets from their stories and their life, but incorporate it back to your life. But be genuine. Be the real deal. Be yourself. Uh, otherwise you just, you know, you're not fooling anybody. I think people know, you know, people know when you're posing, when you're fake and, uh, and it's, that's so unattractive. Um, I mean, I'm drawn to people who are real. Just, just give me who you are, be direct, be real, be the real deal. We, we need more people in our lives that will lie to us said no one ever, uh, you know, just be honest, be, be, be the real deal, be, be genuine. So uh, I, I think that helps you in a lot of different ways, not compare yourself and also to be the best you. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I think that's a, a great way to to answer that. So before I ask the last question, Thomas, I just want to acknowledge you. I think that your willingness to, to fail and put yourself out there, like you said, you were going to go and know that you were going to screw up. You ended up succeeding. Um, but for you to be willing to put yourself out there and try to see what failure really feels like and realize that it's not a big deal is something definitely worth noting. And your storytelling ability is obviously awesome. I was absolutely dying during that one story. And I think that, like you said, for you to be able to create these stories and tell these stories in a way so that other people can extract their own lessons from them so that they can apply them in their own life to get closer to their best self. Um, it's something that you've obviously done to a, to a high level. And I just wanted to want to make sure I acknowledge you for it. Well, I, I appreciate that. You said success. I, I mean, I, I think people define success all different kinds of ways. I'm far less about being successful and more significant. You know, I, I just want to live, I just want to be significant. And I don't think I'm okay if I'm not significant to millions. I, I just want to be significant to my wife, to my faith, to my wife, to my children, to my community, to my friends. And if I think I can, if I can love on those people, you know, be, you know, love on the people that are around me, that I'm okay. I, that, that's a good life to live. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, awesome. If if you are needing a motivational storyteller once quarantine is over, you guys need to go to thomasdismukes.com um, and all that stuff will be linked up in the show notes as well. But uh, last question, Thomas, is again, I think getting closer to the best version of yourself is a constant journey and I think it's a unique journey. I think that the way that I'm going to get closer to the best version of myself is going to be a little bit different than the way that you get closer to the best version of yourself. So for you personally, if there are three things that you can currently do or currently work on to get closer to that best version of Thomas Dismukes that you can be, what are those three things that you could do or work on? Sure. Well, I, I, like I, said, I, I think we've kind of touched on a lot of these things about, uh, you know, about giving it a focus and giving it a balance of life. And, and again, that's, that is exactly what I do every day. That's not some random book that I've mentioned, but it's, I mean, that is my life of keeping the right priorities in life and serving other people. I think a big deal is listening. Just shut up and just listen. That helps me in my life. Uh, you know, I've never learned anything while talking. Even though I do a lot of talking, I tend to pack 10 pounds of sugar in a five pound bag. But um, listen, good gosh, just listen to the heartbeats around us. And it's a man, it's a, it is a gold mine of knowledge. And I think to be the best you, uh, you're not going to do it by yourself. You know, if you're your only teacher, you'll, you'll, it's not much of a, of a teacher, but uh, just to, to learn from around us and enjoy the process. That's right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, good deal. Well, that's all we got today, Thomas. Really appreciate it. It was awesome. 
Nick, I, I genuinely I appreciate you, brother. It was a joy talking with you. Thank you so of much. Course. You're welcome. Yep.